But it got really, really frustrating. It got really frustrating when I was going through all these arguments, trying to figure out whether or not God existed. And I just saw so much animosity between Christians and animosity between religious and non-religious people. And I got to a place where atheism just kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I, I wanted to be an atheist or just not, just simply not believe. What's up everybody? This is Josh for Practical Theism. Today I want to talk about that time that I became an atheist. An atheist, believe it or not. I mean, you're watching a religious channel and some guy became an atheist. Big whoop de doo right? And all of a sudden claims there's God and there's no God. And this was a specific part of my journey that I, I found particularly frustrating. You know, when I was going through all of the uh, history and learning about the faith and trying to figure out this whole thing if like God exists and that was really where I started in my journey. I needed to go back to find out whether or not God exists because if he doesn't, this is all just kind of moot points. Like what are we doing? Why are we talking about debating over faith if it's not even true that God exists, right? So I was started evaluating all of the arguments for and against God's existence. And to be honest, growing up, I wasn't even aware that there were arguments or proofs as they've come to be known. Things like the contingency argument, the fact that everything in this world is contingent on something else, meaning like I'm contingent on breath and air and oxygen and, and food and, you know, I need these things to survive. If I don't have them, I cease to exist, right? Um, and so those things are contingent on other things and my parents, I'm contingent on my parents getting together and then their parents and this goes back and back, but you can't have an infinite regress of that causal action, right? So there had to be a first mover. So these are some of, some of the examples of like an argument for God's existence, you know? But it got really, really frustrating. It got really frustrating when I was going through all these arguments, trying to figure out whether or not God existed. And I just saw so much animosity between Christians and animosity between religious and non-religious people. And it, I, I kind of was coming from a place where I wanted everybody to just agree <laughs> and uh, kind of living in a fantasy world as if everybody's going to agree. And I got to a place where atheism just kind of hit the nail on the head. I, I, I wanted to be an atheist or just not, just simply not believe. It sounded really nice. You didn't have to deal with any of the moral implications of dealing with any kind of religion that's like, do this, don't do that, you know, morality and all that kind of stuff. Um, you didn't have to worry about going to church on Sunday. You didn't have to worry about any of that. You just kind of pave your own way, do whatever you wanted. And it just seemed so plausible and so, so real. You know, it sounded like, and you, you, there's no shortage of like, scientific arguments that people are putting up for God's existence or lack of existence, I should say. Um, you have some really, really, really bright people who are in the sciences and in disciplines like that um, who uh, don't believe in God. And it just seemed so plausible and so, so real. You know, it sounded like, and you, you, there's no shortage of like, scientific arguments that people are putting up for God's existence or lack of existence, I should say. Um, you have some really, really, really bright people who are in the sciences and in disciplines like that um, who uh, don't believe in God, and they're not theistic. Now you have the opposite on the other end, too, but um, I think that just kind of proved the point. It was like you had a bunch of people, and you listen to some of the atheistic arguments, and they're really good. Like, uh, one of the, I mean, obviously the best one, the best argument against theism is the problem of evil. Why does evil exist? You know, uh, I forget who posited it, but it was you know they made the they made the statement that if God's omnipotent, if He's all powerful, if He's all good, and if He's all knowing, He would have known that evil exists. He would have the power to do something about it, and He'd want to do something about it because He's good. That's a really really compelling argument. You know, the other thing that kind of pushes you in that direction of of being an atheist or just like more agnostic, I guess. You know, it's. Nobody seems to agree. It's like you have so many different flavors of Christianity. So the, the image perception really is just like, well, it's supposed to be this unified force in front, but you have people who are bickering over different things. And that was always really frustrating. So I became an atheist for a short time. And I, I would say that I 
toggled throughout my spiritual journey and oscillated back and forth becoming an atheist. And I'm going to loop in agnostic here too, because in reality, I think it was being looped in with agnosticism. You know, this idea of not really knowing, not really caring to find out. I don't know that I ever you know, you know, made a stake in like a positive claim against theism. But then when I really sat back, and the reason why I couldn't stay there was because when I really sat back and thought about it, first of all, there were so many good arguments for God's existence. Aquinas' five ways, for example, are really good proofs and paths to belief in God. And when I really sat back and evaluated the arguments for and the arguments against, the arguments for always had a consistency and a coherence to them that the arguments against didn't. There was something that always made sense about the contingency argument. There was something that always made sense about the first mover argument. And I couldn't shake that. So it flipped me into this idea that there had to be a creator. You can't get something from nothing. And everything in this world starts with, when you look at the observing the natural universe, everything in this world uh, points to the fact that it comes into existence and then it fades from existence. And that was a, that was a reality I couldn't really skirt, you know? And, um, and so I, I had to rest in the fact that at least there was a God or something that we would call God. The big clincher for me was all growing up, you hear people say God, and then you hear people say like, oh, some force that started things. And you never really kind of put the two together. <laughs> You're always like, you know, a lot of atheists, and for example, that I talk with, they'll say, well, there's some, some force started the universe. You know, some force out there started something. And uh, the theist goes, yeah, God, God started everything, right? And uh, so, so often, uh, you know, the atheist and sometimes even the theist, they don't see the things as like, uh, you know, one of the same thing. Like the force that they're talking about is what a theist calls God. <laughs> That's exactly, we're talking on the same plane. You know, we're classifying it a bit. And um, so once I started recognizing that, it started to make a lot of sense. When I got to that place of understanding like, okay, there was a creator, something that created all of this. That's what a theist would call God. These paths are leaning me to that. You have to get to a place where you have to rest in the conclusion that the information is pointing you to. Even when you can't make the entire thing. And I think that's where faith comes into play here. Because faith isn't the absence of reason and the absence of logic. Rather, it takes logic and reason to the furthest extent that you can and it trusts the conclusion that it's pointing to. And so you do that with anything. You evaluate the claims and you identify which makes the most sense. And it was at that point I got to a place where I could get out of my atheism, out of my agnosticism, and step back and say, you know what? All the evidence is pointing towards the fact that there is a creator that created all that we see. Everything from the design argument which states that this entire universe is so complex, it had to have had an intelligent designer behind it. There are so many things that we can't explain by random happenstance. And uh, to the contingency argument, which really was the clincher for me, meaning things can't infinitely regress in terms of their causal action. There had to have been a first mover or a non-contingent cause that created everything that contains within itself the reason for its own existence. And that is what we call God in the theistic world. Those arguments were really, really powerful. Anyways, I just wanted to share that because I think it's really important to understand that like believers don't just go in blindly to faith. A lot of them really focus on, really, really focus on, uh, have, it, it's gotta make sense to you in order to believe it. Because the only reason to believe something is because it's true. So if you're watching this and you're like, I'm on the fence, I really don't know. I would just ask, have you evaluated the truth claims that they're making and the reasons behind, the credible reasons behind each position? And where does the evidence point you? And that was finally when I was able to get out of that agnosticism and that atheism and be like, cool, there is a creator. That moved me into the next stage of my journey, which was this idea of deism. And uh, that God is, how do we go from God exists to, he's a personal God and he's actually involved with his creation. 
Deism is the belief that God is uninvolved with his creation. He set it up, kind of wound it like a, you know, a, a time watch or a, a mouse and just let it go and is not really involved with it. If you haven't already, hit that like button, pound that subscribe button so we can get more content out to you. And from all of us here at Practical Theism, we'll catch you next time.